Welcome to the conversation at airsafe.com. This is your host, Dr. Todd Curtis, here in beautiful Trolley Square Park in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we're pleased to interview today Patrick Smith, the author of the new book, Cockpit Confidential. Patrick, i uh, glad to have you here. Thanks for having me on, Todd. So is this your second or third book here? It's the second, and this book is... Um a rewrite, you could say, of the first book, Ask the Pilot, which came out in 2004. Uh, it's vastly expanded. Um, the Q&A sections are much longer and more involved. Uh, most all of the essays are new. There's an index and a glossary. Really, it's a whole new book. But the structure of it mimics uh, the first book, the way the, the seven chapters are arranged and named. But uh, if uh, you're a fan of the first book, uh, I don't think you'd be disappointed to pick this one up because it is uh, very different. And I gave short shrift in the old copy to some of the more important uh, fear of flying uh, and safety topics. Everything from turbulence to missed approaches to uh, uh, accident stats and and discussions of of crashes. Um, I guess I didn't realize with the first book uh, how many anxious flyers there are out there. So with this book, I really made an attempt to... uh, target that audience, I think, a little more specifically with some more involved and more in-depth conversations. So this being your second book, I mean, you could probably tell us a thing or two about the whole process of book writing and how it was for you the first time around versus the second time. It's been a much more enjoyable experience this time around. Um, A lot of that is the publisher uh, has been more cooperative, and I had a lot more uh, input into the the uh, design of the book and and of course the content it was it was really a joint effort and I'm very appreciative to uh, the people at source books for uh, helping it to to go as smoothly as it did so you're telling me that you're an author who has actually had a very good experience with your publisher sounds hard to believe doesn't it I was I was very discouraged after the experience with the first book uh, it, it was a combination of a fractious uh, relationship with the publisher and then also um, dealing with the the publishing industry in general particularly the way books are marketed and distributed particularly at airports Um, the first book and this one too were written really to be at the airport Uh, the target demographic for this book is not just anxious flyers but uh, frequent flyers people who travel a lot and so ideally the book would be at the airport in every little newsstand, every kiosk, in front of all these people who fly, and you'd be amazed at how difficult it is to get placement at airports. Airport books are all controlled by almost a a little mafia of of retailers. Uh, There are only two or three companies that control probably 80 or 90 percent of the books sold at airports, and it's it's very hard to get on their list for uh, airport distribution unless you're willing to pay for it and publishers usually uh, balk at that. So it sounds like the book publishing industry for your standard paperback or hardback book is as tough as it's ever been. What about like a Kindle or ebook version of this? Do you have that available as well? There is uh, an electronic version. There's a Kindle version. Uh, I believe there's a Nook and the book is available on iTunes uh, as well of course as the uh, hard copy. Um, I'm kind of kind of a traditionalist, so I encourage people to uh, go with the hard copy, but there are electronic uh, copies available also. So uh, the first book was in 2004, I believe it was. So this was before the era of e-books as we know them. So virtually all of your sales for that were, were traditional books. Has the old one been available as an e-book as well, or is it still in print? It recently went out of print. Um, I actually bought the rights to the book back from the publisher to have it taken out of print so that I could emphasize the new book and market the new book more forcefully. Uh, and also because the old book really was, was extremely out of date. And I was never particularly happy with it. Uh, the way it was edited and, and kind of rushed into print, uh, there were errors in the text and it, it just didn't read as, as smoothly as I wanted it to. Uh, this book went through much more extensive editing and, and more careful preparation. And on the whole, it, it's just a much, much better book overall. And so I wanted to get the old one uh, out of there so that uh, there wouldn't be any confusion. So you might be able to still grab uh, used copies uh, through online retailers, but technically, officially, the book is out of print now. 
Now, full disclosure, as many of you know, I wrote a review for this book that's available at airsafenews.com. And I, among other things, said that this book was a love affair, or described a love affair, a long-term relationship between Patrick and aviation. So this isn't just a book about fearful flying or just a book about how bad food is in, in coach these days. You also get into things like the aesthetics of aviation and the beauty that seems to have been forgotten by this generation of flyers and, unfortunately, executives. Yeah, that's a great uh, great point, Todd. And uh, some background here. Um, the book was written primarily uh, as a source of information. Uh, when it comes to commercial flying, there's just so much bad info out there. Conspiracy theories, urban legends. I, I don't need to tell you about this. So that's the primary focus of the book is, is to inform. Whether you're a nervous flyer or a frequent flyer, there's, there's lots of good info in here about everything from physics of flight to uh, safety issues, uh, a whole discussion, a whole chapter really about uh, pilot culture, uh, airline culture, all that sort of thing. But also, too, what I'm doing is, is encouraging people to try to change their perspective a little bit and go into the uh, air travel experience with, with a slightly different outlook, um, maybe not so much contempt. I mean, let's face it, people hate to fly. And believe it or not, I ask people to try to reappreciate the experience somewhat. And, well, you know, how in the world can I do that? Uh, with, with all of the uh, contempt people have for flying, that would seem a lost cause. But uh, first of all, I, I like to remind people of just how affordable flying is these days. Um, it wasn't too long ago that only a very small segment of the population could afford to fly at all, and that's certainly not true anymore. Almost everybody can afford to, and, and almost everybody flies at least once a year. There was a study a few months ago that showed that airfares are about half of what they were 30 years ago. And that's lost on a lot of people. And yes, by the way, that, that does include all of those annoying baggage fees and other ancillary fees that, that people hate and, and that airlines uh, love to charge nowadays. Then you've got the safety aspect. And this is important. Um, in the U.S., uh, there hasn't been, for example, a, a large-scale fatal accident involving a major carrier since November of 2001. And that's a record that, as far as I know, goes back at least to the dawn of the jet age, if not back through the entire history of commercial aviation. Uh, there have been a handful of regional plane accidents uh, since 2001, but not a, a, a plane crash, an air disaster, as, as we think of one involving a major carrier. And that's pretty remarkable. And you almost wouldn't know it, though, listening to the media, because there's... Every time there's some sort of minor mishap or incident, it's, it's overhyped and spun up by the media. And I think that plants the idea in people's minds that flying is more hazardous than ever. And there are more things going wrong than ever before. But really, just the opposite is true. So you take those two things together, uh, the affordability and the safety. Combine that with the improved reliability of flying. Uh, about 85% of flights nowadays arrive on time. That's a pretty strong number, and it's actually been getting better. Um, take those three together, and, and you've got a system that's really not all that bad, and, and people should, I think, adjust their perspective somewhat to realize that and, and to romanticize this a little bit. You know, here in 2013, a person can go out to Kennedy Airport, get on a 747, and fly literally halfway around the world in about 15 hours. Um, you know, that's a trip that in, in ages past uh, took, uh, you know, weeks or months in a sailing ship. And here you can do it in, in half a day for a few pennies per mile, eight or nine cents a mile on average when you, when you look at fares, in almost perfect safety and uh, in reasonable comfort. I mean, you know, how is that not cool? Well, let's uh, talk about three kinds of cool uh, while we're at it. Uh, first, you talked about the... Uh, safety aspect, which, why is that cool? Well, less is more when it comes to accidents, as those of you who are, have been to airsafe.com have probably figured out by now. I'm also a big fan of uh, lowered accident rates, and we have that, certainly. Now, the other thing, the other part of cool I wanted to talk about here is 
one of the huge changes since both of us began our aviation careers is that we have instant communication around the world all the time from everyone's cell phone and mobile phone and whatnot. But that leads into the perception problem. So how do you talk to passengers about the fact that, yes, we can tell you the facts about how cool and how safe it is, but you have this reality, YouTube and what have you, and cable television, and full disclosure, Patrick and I have both been on at least one or two of these uh, made-for-cable specials to talk about accidents and such. How do you reconcile that with the images they see and the words they read and blogs and whatnot versus the reality? What you're asking basically is how do you get good information, accurate information out there through all of the noise? Uh, and by noise, I mean media stories and, and internet gossip and, and all these different conspiracy theories and, and urban legends. There's so much out there. Um, I, I don't know the best way of dealing with it. The best way I can deal with it is to write a book and, and to, to host my website and just try to get good info out there to people. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult in this age, and, and people need to learn, I think, to be more uh, discerning. And, and skeptical, really, of, of a lot of the information they come across. So let's deal with the urban legend and conspiracy theory for a minute. In your opinion, what are the two or three things about the aviation industry as a whole that would make it extremely difficult for any kind of conspiracy to actually be pulled off when it comes to accidents or deliberate actions against aircraft? Well, when I talk about conspiracy theories or or urban legends. I'm, I'm not talking about, for example, the uh, 9-11 conspiracy theory, you know, which holds that uh, the aircraft uh, that were hijacked on 9-11 were actually flown by remote control or, or didn't exist at all. Uh, you know, there are those kind of things out there. And, I, you know, I do give that some attention in the book and, and in my online articles. But mainly what I'm talking about are um, kind of smaller scale uh, urban myths um, you know I've been accused of, of putting bad information out there myself uh, which you know is a little ridiculous but you know I get emails accusing me of being an airline apologist uh, on one hand and then of you know, trying to scare people on the other hand and, and how do you have it both ways um, I'm not sure the best way of, of approaching uh, or dealing with that sort of thing other than to just uh, as I try to do keep telling the truth so let's uh, step back for a moment. Well, before we step into that area for a moment, another part of cool I sort of mentioned before but didn't get back to until now. You said that now compared to days past, it's much easier price-wise to fly all over the world. Yet in your book, Cockpit Confidential, Everything You Need to Know About Air Travel by Patrick Smith, 2013, you mentioned somewhat sadly that many of your own colleagues people who not only can afford to fly, but actually have the right to have low pass, low price uh, tickets through airlines, that many of them don't even have passports. Many of them are not taking advantage of this huge opportunity. Why is that? I really don't know, and it's something that's uh, always bothered me a little bit, uh, to work with people who, although they can travel all over the world uh, for next to nothing, uh, seldom leave home. Uh, except when it's to come to work. Um, you know, part of that maybe is when you fly a lot for a living, sometimes the last thing in the world you want to do when you're home is, is repack and get on another plane. But I think mostly uh, more so it's, it's just something uh, in the American mindset, something that's part of American culture. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to disparage everybody out there. I, there are a lot of my colleagues who, uh, who love to travel, but but many do not, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where this uh, kind of isol isolationist attitude comes from, but it is something that is, is peculiar to this country, and I see that uh, traveling around the world. Um, for example, when I'm in a, a group tour, and I, I've taken group tours in, in many different places, uh, Namibia, Egypt, uh, in India uh, and so on uh, often uh, I'm the only American in the group uh, and meanwhile there's uh, people from Australia and, and Canada and, and Holland and Switzerland and Israel Japan um, uh, maybe part of it too is Americans are, are overworked we just we don't get a lot of vacation time 
Um, I think in Australia, for example, you know, six or eight weeks vacation is the norm. We're here, you know, a lot of people are lucky if they get two weeks. Now, before we talk about vacation time for the flying community, uh, flight attendants and, and pilots, I'd like to ask you a couple of things about the lifestyle of a pilot. Literally, how much time you spend working. You mentioned in the book where uh, pilots may only have 60, 70, 80 hours a month of flying, but that's uh, sort of not really giving a full picture. That 60 or 80 hours a month is really wrapped around two, th two or three weeks per month on the road as a part of your job. Tell us about that and how that sort of turns some people off at the idea of being a pilot. Yeah, that's a difficult question. You know, how, how much does a pilot work? Well, it, it's a tough thing to quantify because are we talking about flight hours, strictly speaking, or are we talking about time away from home? Uh, those, those can be very different things. I might work a, a six or a seven day assignment somewhere overseas, um, and out of all that, maybe I'll only fly uh, two, two legs. Um, you know, a long flight over and then have several days layover and one flight back. Um, so in terms of hours aloft, um, you could say, well, you, you're only working, quote unquote, um, working, I don't know, 16 hours, but I could be away from home for eight days. Now that might seem to be a, a, a rather onerous requirement, but some people might say, hey, you pilots are paid so much. In fact, I was at a talk by a, a VP for Lufthansa a few weeks ago where he mentioned that they have a multi-tiered system. They have newer airline subsidiaries where they can charge uh, pilots, uh, well, allow pilots a much lower wage. But their old line carrier, Lufthansa, their senior pilots might be getting the equivalent of $400,000 a year. So uh, are there pilots in the U.S. For, flying for U.S. carriers who are getting $400,000 a year? Um, no. <laughs> There are uh, plenty of senior captains out there who do very well, though not that well. Um, you know, uh, having some tenure, some seniority at a major carrier, uh, it's not a bad, uh, a bad lifestyle, a bad income by any means. But getting to that point is, is very difficult. It takes a long time. Uh, when I started flying commercially uh, in 1990, when I was hired as a co-pilot on a unpressurized 15-seat turboprop, my very first airline job, I was, uh, what, 24? My pay was $850 a month. And I paused there for emphasis. Um, 1990 was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And salaries today at the regional carriers, while they're better, they're not a whole lot better. And it's interesting, a lot of pilots getting into the industry um, have to now reckon with the fact that a position with a regional airline, um, which used to be seen as just a stepping stone on the career path to a major carrier, now, uh, because the regional sector is so big, um, often that job at a, at a regional means an entire career at a regional with a relatively low return on investment. It takes a lot of money and a lot of time to build up the hours and experience to get that job. And then, you know, starting salaries are somewhere around 20 grand a year. And eventually you can top out somewhere in the low six figures, but it, it takes a long time to get to that point. And because of that, the applicant pool at the regional carriers is, is drying up and these airlines are having a harder time attracting qualified pilots. And that's where the pilot shortage that we keep hearing about comes into play. The pilot shortage isn't something that's ever going to affect the major carriers. The big airlines will always, always, always have their pick of, of military pilots and senior regional pilots. It's the bottom end of the regional carriers where the problem is, the uh, entry-level positions that are getting harder to fill. Now, my opinion is that that's not going to be a long-term problem, that the industry will figure out a way to bring people in. There are plenty of people out there who want to fly, so that ultimately is what's going to keep the industry healthy. But I think initially there, there's going to be a, a spike where there is going to be a shortage in the, in the next uh, few coming years. Uh, exactly how bad that shortage will be remains to be seen. Well, now we're on the subject of how much does a starting off pilot make, let's say 20000 a year. 
Now, to get to that $20,000 a year job, what kind of cash does a pilot, a prospective professional pilot, have to lay out between you know, college education, if college is required, and professional education, like getting your pilot's license and such? How much are we talking here? Yeah, and this is something I talk about uh, pretty extensively in Chapter 4 in the book, which is all about becoming a pilot, the pilot lifestyle, pilot culture. Um, basically, to be competitive nowadays uh, at a regional airline and to meet the uh, requirements, especially the new uh, requirements that the FAA has put in place, which dictate a new hire applicant has to have uh, 1,500 hours minimum of total flight time, and that's broken down further into subcategories. Um, you're, you're talking about a private pilot's license, a commercial license, a multi-engine license, instrument rating, uh, and eventually what's known as an ATP, or Airline Transport Pilot Certificate. Y you've basically got to have all of that before you even think about applying to an airline. There are two ways to kind of move down that path. One is to go to uh, an aviation college uh, where the, the program is geared for, for becoming an airline pilot. You move very quickly, building up your, your hours and experience. The other way is to do it piecemeal, piecemeal which is the way I did it, um, building up your, your experience uh, as you can afford it, hours at a time, getting your ratings one at a time. And, you know, for me, there were periods of, of weeks and sometimes even uh, months or more where I just couldn't afford to go out and fly, or my parents couldn't afford, I should say. Um, but eventually I, I did build up all of the requisite ratings and, and was able to apply. How much did it cost? I would guess somewhere around uh, fifty or sixty thousand uh, dollars and it's considerably more expensive today. This was the mid 80s when I was flying or when I was a student. Somewhere in there um, you know pilots will uh, become instructors uh, and work uh, flight instructing to help build time and make a little bit of income at the same time. Uh, there are positions as you know, charter pilot, uh, air taxi outfits, uh, that sort of thing. You, you've really got to pound the pavement and, and kind of improvise a little bit to, uh, to be in a position where you can build valuable experience, especially in multi-engine aircraft. I used to go around leaving flyers on people's private planes and, and sometimes uh, business jets, whatever, just basically begging for for some right seat time so that I could log it. And it, 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 that's a tough, slow, um, not always dignified way to go about it. But that's what I went through, and a lot of people go through that today. I had this vision of you uh, putting flyers under the windshield wipers of uh, multi-million dollar executive jets. But on the subject of how do you uh, come to the ranks and pay for this, What's preventing pilots? Maybe they're doing it already. I don't know. Maybe you can tell us. What's preventing pilots from saying, the heck with this? I don't want to go for a $20,000 job here in the States. Why can't I try my luck at one of these Middle East airlines who are hiring people at nearly six figures right off the bat as opposed to 20000 a year? Well, a lot of these overseas carriers are uh, hiring uh, expat pilots, but uh, generally the pilots they're looking for are pretty experienced. I have a friend who, re who recently went to work at Emirates. Um, and he had already worked for five or six airlines here in the U.S. Um, TWA, American, uh, Spirit Airlines. So he'd, he'd been through the ringer. And you know, resumes like his aren't uncommon. I have a friend in Texas who has worked, I think, for 12 or 13 airlines over the years. Been furloughed six or seven times. Been through several bankruptcies and liquidations. Uh, that's not uncommon. Um, the industry is very cyclical, very unpredictable. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are, are scared away from becoming pilots. You, you really have to have it in your heart and, and want to do it because there are so many potential pitfalls along the way. I mean, I'm 47 now. I've got a good uh, position at a major carrier, but it didn't come easy. I was 36, I think, before I was hired, and I'd already worked for four carriers before that. Uh, other guys are, are luckier and, you know, maybe, maybe they come out of the military and then slip right into a, a position with a major carrier at the front end of a hiring wave and, and they never see a furlough, never see a, any sort of uh, thorn in their, in their career. But that's unusual. Now, speaking of the thorns that might be in the side of uh, careers in the future, 
there's a lot of talk, not more than a lot of talk, there's actually a lot of organizational inertia going toward changing the airspace system here and abroad to allow uh, autonomous or remotely controlled aircraft. Now, this is not to say that you're going to have robots flying passengers, but certainly if this takes off at something other than an experimental sort of thing, that is, if you see this being viable, where you can have, let's say, cargo aircraft flying in and out of commercial airports, the same ones that passengers use. What are the two effects, one, on the safety of the system, and two, on the prospects for professional pilots, if this were to come to pass five to ten years down the line? I think five or ten years is being very optimistic for any sort of large-scale commercial autonomous flight. Um, that's not to say that, that drones and, and other uh, unmanned aerial vehicles of one kind or another uh, don't pose a, a potential uh, safety threat. I think they do. We're seeing more and more of these things. They're becoming smaller. They're becoming more accessible. Uh, is it just a matter of time before there's a collision between a UAV of some kind and a commercial plane? I, I, I hope not, but it is something that concerns me. It concerns a lot of people. Is that sort of thing, a mid-air collision between aircraft, much less likely today? And what else has been changed about the system that makes the system less risky than it was when we were young? It is much less likely. Uh, still possible, but anything is possible, but it is much less likely. Uh, it's, it's something that, uh, it's a danger that like a lot of other dangers, we've mostly engineered away uh, through better crew training and better technology. In this case, uh, mostly the device known as TCAS, T-C-A-S, which we have in the cockpit, which helps uh, pilots avoid, avoid each other in the air. Uh, primarily, it's air traffic control's function to keep uh, aircraft separate, and they do an excellent job at that. Um, and then as a, as a fallback, we have this uh, cockpit equipment, the TCAS system, uh, that's there just in case. It works very well. Um, but, you know, looking at air safety in whole, um, to r basically repeat what I just said, we've, we've engineered away a lot of what used to be the most common causes of crashes. And globally, the last number I saw, we're, we're about six times safer than we were a quarter century ago, which is pretty remarkable when you, when you look at the growth of air travel in certain countries, China, India, Russia, uh, Brazil. There was a time, it wasn't too long ago, when, when industry experts were very worried and were predicting that by where we are right now, uh, there was going to be a plague of accidents, that we were going to be seeing serious crashes, uh, hull losses, um, at a rate of up to one per week. That was the prediction uh, 10, 20 years ago, and that didn't happen. Um, even in, in these de developing countries where air travel is growing rapidly, we're just not seeing that. Um, it's, it's very safe, and there are different reasons for that. The, the primary one is uh, better crew training. Um, over the years, uh, the implementation of uh, crew resource management training, um, not to go off on that tangent, but, you know, has been very uh, helpful worldwide. Uh, before we get uh, further into uh, CRM, uh, let's step back for a minute and talk a little bit about the, a term you used, hull loss, which uh, for those of us who are in the industry, we know exactly what a hull loss is, but for the average passenger, they might be a little bit confused about this. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I liken a hull loss to totaling a car in an accident. You can have a car totaled and no one injured. And in fact, uh, some of the more famous uh, incidents in history, for example, uh, Sully Soddenberger landing on the H Hudson, that was a hull loss and no one was killed. And in fact, hull losses happen on a fairly regular basis, several times a year. But again, no one gets killed in most of these. That's a good point. Um, you know, there's this idea out there that, well, if you're in a plane crash, uh, you know, that's the end of it. Everybody's dead. And, and that's not true at all. In fact, most accidents, as surely you know, do have uh, survivors. Most accidents are survivable. You know, there are certain very high profile crashes, uh, you know, where everybody on the plane is killed. But, but most accidents, incidents are not like that. Uh, the Sullenberger uh, Hudson River incident is a great example. We also had the uh, Air France uh, Airbus uh, runway overrun in Toronto, I think it was a few years ago, where the plane went off the end, caught fire, uh, potential catastrophe, except every single person got off the plane. 
I'd like to comment about uh, that one briefly. That one had very little coverage in the U.S. for a couple of reasons. One, it didn't happen in the U.S. Two, no one died. And three, the media of Canada isn't as good at uh, promoting stories to the world as the media in the U.S. is. But that aside, that was an interesting accident in that the uh, aircraft had about had eight exit doors, and the vast majority of people escaped out of one door. And this is an airplane that was... Uh, broken up somewhat and catching fire. So again, uh, between the design of the aircraft, the training of the crews, and the emergency procedures that are built into uh, what the crews are taught to do and the equipment, in many cases, fairly serious accidents result in no one being killed. Now, another thing that Patrick mentioned, uh, that you mentioned, was CRM, Cockpit Crew Resource Management, excuse me, Crew Resource Management, where, and again, I'm maybe oversimplifying this, the old school way of running a cockpit was the captain is God and is not questioned. But with crew resource management, everyone has a role and no one has veto power over someone else speaking up. Is that an oversimplification or am I more or less on point there? Well, you're more or less on point. We look at some past accidents. Uh, the collision on Tenerife, for example, in 1977. Um, a couple of uh, Korean air accidents uh, in in the 90s, I think it was. Um, you know, we're we're directly or indirectly caused by uh, kind of an over authoritarian uh, crew member, a captain who uh, was calling the shots, and and that's it. You you, you didn't question him. You, you did as told, uh, right into the ground. In some cases, um, that culture is mostly gone now worldwide. Uh, a crew, a cockpit crew, is a team, and everybody works together. And you're, you're free and open to, to question each other. A first officer can certainly question a captain. And, and if a first officer is not comfortable with something, um, almost always uh, the, the captain will defer to that. And, and this is part of what CRM, crew resource management, is all about. It's also about collaborating and, and working together with the rest of your team. And by that I mean cabin crew members, um, Dispatchers on the ground, air traffic control, everybody working together. Uh, a great example is, is uh, an incident, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago now, at least a year ago, in Poland, where a 767 uh, landed with its, its landing gear fully retracted. Uh, it was relatively minor, and, and I wasn't at all surprised that, that nobody was injured or killed. Uh, there are many worse things that can happen to an airplane than not being able to lower its landing gear. Uh, but what struck me really about the accident was, was the way the crew, together with its dispatchers, together with uh, the cabin crew and uh, emergency personnel on the ground, so professionally coordinated the uh, landing and the evacuation. Really the most dangerous part of that accident was the evacuation on a runway. People, hundreds of people going down those slides onto the asphalt. Those slides are very, very steep and you're traveling at a pretty high rate of speed when you go down there and then um, the way the cabin crew handled it was was very noteworthy uh, same thing in in the Hudson River accident the Sullenberger accident uh, you know I think uh, I'm gonna go off on this Sullenberger thing for a minute if you don't mind I think hero is one of the most overused uh, words in American culture and uh, Captain Sullenberger was really made out to be a hero after that accident. And, uh, you know, I, I bristle at that, and, and so does he, because really what he did is, is what he had to do. There really wasn't any option. Um, you know, a hero, I think, by definition, is somebody who willingly risks life and limb to save others. Uh, he was just doing what he had to do, falling back on his training. And he wasn't a hero. He was a professional. That's the way I look at it. Um... Also, he was uh, ably assisted by his uh, first officer, a man named Jeffrey Skiles, whose name is almost never mentioned when, when the Hudson incident is talked about. And that's too bad, because remember, there are always two pilots, at least two pilots in a cockpit, and both are full-fledged pilots. The uh, first officer, the co-pilot, uh, colloquially, is not an apprentice, uh, is not a helper, it's not a learning position. Um, Co-pilots are, are pilots, and you only become a captain by, by virtue of seniority. It has nothing to do with, with how good a pilot or how skillful you are. Um, I'm a first officer, so I, I take offense sometimes when people refer to the captain as the pilot and me as uh, something else. 
Um, where was I going with that? Oh, uh, after the uh, the splashdown in the river, uh, the way the the egress was coordinated um, was was very good, very professional, and and the flight attendants on that aircraft uh, deserve a lot of credit for that. Again, that's that's part of CRM. Everybody on the plane working together to make sure everybody gets out, and they did. A couple of points there. It's standard procedure for airlines to switch off who flies. That is, the captain flies one leg, first officer the next leg, and vice versa. So you basically fly half the routes. Correct. Uh, Co-pilots, uh, first officers, whatever you want to call us, uh, we perform just as many uh, hands-on takeoffs and landings as captains do. So you don't necessarily know who's landing your plane, uh, captain or first officer. Usually if it's a rough landing, it's the captain, and uh, we first officers make the smoother landings. <laughs> don't I wish. <laughs> That reminds me of a point I wanted to bring up earlier, perhaps a sore point with some uh, crew members, cabin crew and cockpit crew. Given the strangeness of the pay scales that may happen at an airline, is it possible that the most highly paid person, crew member on an aircraft, is actually a flight attendant? <laughs> Not usually, but it, it, it could happen. Airline salaries in, in this country are dictated almost exclusively by seniority. And if you're a very junior pilot, it's, it's not uh, unheard of for a very senior flight attendant to be making more money than you. Now, does that make the pilots upset or the flight attendants happy or both? Yeah, it's not really anything that comes up. Uh, in fact, there's a, a segment in my book where I talk about this. And uh, honestly, it, was, it, was only, it wasn't until I was writing the book that I really stopped and thought about that and crunched a few numbers and sure enough. So I haven't ever looked at flight attendants the same way again since. No, no, there's no, uh, no friction really between the groups about something like that. I like to think we're uh, above that sort of uh, pettiness. Now, I'm glad you used the word pettiness because this brings up another point that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, you obviously a professional airline pilot, and you're also obviously an author who writes about the world of airlines. Not too many pilots that you know of write books that are not ghostwritten by someone else. So, how often do you get uh, flack from your colleagues that, hey Patrick, you're telling tales out of school, you shouldn't be saying this to the people out there, you'll get them scared or whatever? Yeah, great question. Um, first of all, let's, let's back up, you know, how did I get into this sort of thing? You know, I always had kind of a latent interest in writing, going back to, oh, when I was a kid, and then in the 1980s, uh, publishing uh, punk rock fanzines, and at one point, kind of a little poetry journal sort of thing. But it wasn't anything I ever took seriously or, or thought I could make money from until uh, I was laid off in the aftermath of September 11th, at which point uh, suddenly air travel was on everybody's mind, um, mostly for the wrong reasons. But, you know, here I had uh, a niche I felt that I could really uh, exploit. I had uh, kind of this urge to write, and I also was an airline pilot with, with a decent expertise. And I put those two things together, and, and the result was uh, the column on Salon.com that ran for almost 10 years. Ask the Pilot, and then uh, the website now of the same name that I run, and, and the new book. Um, you know, whether I'm more cerebral than other pilots, I, I don't know. Um, it, it was always my opinion, though, that the best uh, writing... The best aviation writing was from outsiders, people not from the industry, um, which isn't to say there aren't intelligent, articulate people in the industry, but I think it's the, uh, the outsiders always had a better understanding of, of which nuances of the business were, were more compelling. I mean, hopefully I, I do a good job at it, but I'm, I'm certainly not the best. Who else is out there? Who's your competition? You'll notice the uh, hesitation because I can't think of anybody. Um, it's an unusual gig for a pilot to be writing, especially writing for the mainstream traveling public and not for other pilots. Um, I don't know, you tell me, who else is out there? I can't think of anybody. You know, I'm thinking most of them are too uh, chicken to uh, risk their careers by doing so. But this brings up another point. What kind of media exposure do you have because of your writing and because of your books? Well, quite a bit. I mean, I've been on hundreds of, of radio and, and TV shows, and yeah, this is an interesting point. Um, you know, most of what I, what I do, what I say and what I write is, is extremely pro-flying. 
Uh, I, I don't do sensationalism. I don't do tabloidy uh, expose sort of things. Uh, I'm out there to give people good and accurate information, which usually is just the opposite of that. Almost always when I'm writing or, or talking in response to some story that's in the media, it, it, it's to quell uh, the, the sensationalism and the hype. And, and really the book is, is mostly the same way. It, it probably comes across um, in a lot of ways as being, uh, what's the word? Uh, well, put it this way, I, I get letters all the time from people accusing me of being an airline shill. Um, you know, because I'm not, you know, just, just towing the usual line that, that airlines hate you and, and they're out to, to lie to you and steal your money and, and get you killed. Uh, I, I don't believe that at all. Flying is very safe, and, and on the whole, you know, airlines are not evil. They're, they're, they're businesses like most other businesses. They're out there to make money, that's true, but, you know, they're not anywhere near the villains that, that passengers think. Now, I'm biased. I work for an airline. I'm proud of my airline. Um, but that doesn't mean that's not true. Um, and this is something I talk about in Chapter uh, 7, I believe it is. I talk about airlines uh, as communicators. You know, why are they such bad communicators? Why do they manage to somehow maintain such terrible reputations? Um, you know, airlines don't, as a policy, lie to people, contrary to what everybody thinks. Usually what happens is, is this. Airlines are very compartmentalized. There are all these different departments. Each department has its own, its own lingo, its own vernacular, its own set of priorities a lot of time, times. And what happens during a problem, say a delay or a maintenance issue, is information gets passed from department to department. And along the way, it, it, it gets changed. <laughs> it's like that game you played in school where you, you whispered a story around the room. By the time it gets to the end, it, it may or may not uh, resemble uh, the, the original. In the same way, what you hear coming over the, the PA system at the gate during a, lay, during a delay may or may not uh, represent the truth of the problem. Um, things get lost in translation, so to speak. You know, really, that's what you're dealing with. It's not I intentional um, lying by the carrier. Um, I, I go out of my way during delays and, and um, maintenance delays, traffic delays, whatever. I go out of my way to present very accurate information to the people, to the passengers, uh, without, you know, getting too caught up in, in kind of the technical jargon where people go, what in the world is he talking about? I, I think there's a way to, to give people good, accurate information without talking down to them or, or confusing them. And it, it's not an easy thing to do, and I'm probably not perfect at it, but I, but I try, and I wish uh, other of my colleagues tried harder at that, and I wish carriers too. You know, what, what is it I want to know? with this country's berserk infatuation with public address announcements. And I talk about this in chapter three in my essay about airports. Uh, I believe it's called, What's the Matter with Airports? Um, US airports are just so damn loud. And, and one of the reasons they're so damn loud is you have these uh, layers of public address announcement, sometimes two, three, or four of them playing at the same time. And almost always it's information we don't really need. Uh, security announcements, uh, uh, boarding calls, you know, six or seven boarding calls for the same flight. Uh, we can figure it out. We don't need to be bombarded with all of this sound, especially when not when you've got those damn um, news monitors playing at the same time and then phones ringing and babies crying. It, it, it's weird because it's not until you actually get on the airplane finally that there's some peace and quiet. And hopefully that will remain the case. And, and with that, I'm segueing into the, the topic of allowing cell phones on planes. Uh, is, is that a good idea? I say no, and not only for technological reasons, but for social reasons. You know, who wants to be on, a, on an airplane with 200 people all talking on their phone at the same time? I can't think of anything more horrible. Um, maybe at some point there can be... Uh, a rule where you have a certain window of time to use your phone during a flight, or maybe a, a phone and a no phone section, kind of the way there, there used to be smoking and non-smoking. But I, I just can't imagine being on a plane with just a, you know, an open license to use your phone whenever you wanted to. It would, it would be unbearable. Well, on the subject of uh, getting good information in a tight situation, if you're a passenger, something happens, you have a delay, and you're sitting around the terminal, other than standing in the line to get your ticket change, 
what can you do to either give yourself decent information or give yourself a better chance at making sure you get the connection you need or make sure you get your flight rescheduled? So to their credit, carriers now um, have become more proactive uh, and, and preemptive during uh, delays, weather delays especially, where uh, you know, numerous flights tend to be delayed at the same time. They have uh, telephones now, banks of phones set up where passengers can, can just pick up and talk to an agent and, and be reissued a ticket. Some carriers are doing that uh, through automated kiosks now. These things didn't used to exist. You used to have to always get in a long line and wait and wait and wait, and that's changing now uh, through um, better technology. So I want to make sure you get a chance to talk about one of my favorite groups in aviation, a group that every passenger knows very well and every passenger has a very strong opinion of. My favorite letter is TSA. Now, specifically, the part of TSA that passengers see, not the behind-the-scenes TSA, which does whatever they do, but we're talking about face-to-face -face with the passenger, how they go about doing what they do. What do you have to say about their general competence and about the organization's mission when it comes to direct passenger uh, relations? I'm glad, first, all, that, first up, that you separated uh, the TSA that we see on the concourse from the TSA behind the scenes, because there's a big difference there, and it's an, an important difference, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, Airport security is something we could talk about all day long. It's hard to say where to begin. Uh, um, I think first and foremost, what, what we need to get away from, what TSA needs to get away from, and this is something I talk about in Chapter 5 in the book. There's a big essay in there about security, which I'm basically going to paraphrase for you here. Uh, we need to get away from the idea that every single person who flies is a potential terrorist on equal footing. Um, in the U.S., about 2 million people move through the system every day. And that's just not a sustainable approach when you have that many people flying. We need to move to a what they call risk-based approach. And when I say that, it brings up the word profiling, which freaks a lot of people out. Um, what does that mean? And, and, and there's the idea that... Well, profiling is, is, you know, you take all the people with this color skin and you put them in this line and all the rest of the people get in this line. It's, it's not nearly so simple. Effective profiling takes a whole wide range of data points, everything from how you paid for your ticket to your nation of origin and a million things in between. And it, it that way breaks down people into categories, some of which will receive greater scrutiny than others. That's probably the best way to do airport screening. It's not perfect, but it's probably the best way. What is perfect, nothing is perfect, uh, which brings up the next point, which is you're, we're never, ever, ever going to be 100% safe. And there's always going to be a way for somebody who's determined enough to skirt the system and get through. To that end, the real job of, of airport security isn't something that we see on the concourse at all. It goes on backstage so to speak. It's the job of, of TSA working with the FBI and, and CIA and law enforcement to, to stop terrorists before they get to the airport, to break up plots in the planning stage. Really, that's what airport security is all about. So let me um, say this. Would you be the kind of person who would say that dressing up the TSA security officers in outfits that look exactly like police uniforms with badges that look like police badges even though they do not have police powers including the power of arrest or a power to use force even though they are unarmed and have no law enforcement training you think that this is more aviation security theater rather than aviation security uh, as it should be I do and uh, you're right, the uh, TSA guards are now called officers, and, and they wear police-style shirts and badges, and, and yet they have no law enforcement power. It's, it's definitely a, a show. Um, you know, that should bother more Americans, I think, than it does bother. But in a way, too, I can see TSA's point. Um, you know, I've backed off somewhat in my criticism of TSA over the past couple of years. They, they were my usual sitting target when I wrote on Salon all those years. Uh, and there's uh, a somewhat less than flattering essay in my book about TSA and security. But, you know, I, I think the agency works hard. But again, most of the good stuff that it does is stuff that we don't see.
Uh, what's there on the concourse? Yeah, it's it's mostly there, I think, as theater. Not entirely. Uh, there there is an important role for the guards on the concourse, but it's not the primary uh, aspect of airport security. That is something we don't see. I feel that we're in some sort of AA session. I have to admit that I, too, have had to back off on the TSA over the last couple of years because, like you said, they do play a role, a very important role. And to focus on that part of the role that gets us most upset as passengers is missing the whole point of the entire organization. And, and again, the more general thing that they're trying to do. So, again, I'm not a defender of the TSA, 100% of what they do, but I do think that uh, passengers should look at them a little bit more fully than they may have in the past. I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, one of the overarching ironies of all of this is uh, going back to 9-11, that the the success of the 9-11 attacks really didn't have anything to do with airport security per se in the first place. Uh, uh, This is something I talk about in that same essay in Chapter 5. Conventional wisdom is that the 9-11 hijackers succeeded because they smuggled box cutters onto planes, and so we banned box cutters. But really, box cutters had nothing to do with it, uh, almost nothing. Uh, the attackers weren't taking advantage of, of a loophole in security. What they were taking advantage of was our mindset at the time. And by that, I mean our understanding of, of what a hijacking was and how it was going to unfold. And that was based on all the hijackings from years past. Uh, take me to Cuba and and diversions to Beirut and and hostage standoffs and and ransom and all that sort of thing. Uh, It wasn't about weapons. It it was about the element of surprise. Uh, They could have used any weapons, uh, anything. They they could have made sharp knives of some kind on the airplane um, had the box cutters been banned. It it wasn't about that. It was all about taking advantage of, of our thinking. And of course, all of that is changed now. It was changed even before that morning had ended when the passengers on uh, United 93 finally figured out what was going on and reacted the way they did. Uh, I think that as a strategy, as a, as a terrorist strategy, the 9-11 blueprint is, is really off the table now. It, it couldn't happen again. And so I think, meanwhile, we waste a little bit too much time uh, you know, rifling through bags, looking for little pointy objects and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we're still fixated and still kind of hung over uh, by September 11th. And we need to get out from under that in order to better rationalize security. One last security story for me. As uh, those who travel in the U.S. know, uh, virtually everyone has to take off their shoes. Uh, the last time, uh, one of the last times I flew internationally from outside the U.S. into the U.S., it was on a United Airlines uh, 747 from Sydney going to Los Angeles. Clearly a high-profile flight, and yet the Australian authorities didn't require that we take off our shoes. So I had to scratch my head and think, well, gee, if a flight that is much more likely to be attractive to an evildoer doesn't have to take off our shoes, why do we have to take off our shoes on the flight from, I don't know, Corpus Christi to Houston? Just a general question. You don't have to answer that. (laughs) I'm not going to answer because I think the the silliness of it just kind of speaks for itself. Now, that's true with with the body scanners, too. Uh, you know, you'll have one at one checkpoint, but you don't have one at the checkpoint right next to it. Uh, I didn't realize terrorists were that stupid, but... You fail to realize, and I'll probably have to excise this from the conversation, you fail to realize that there are companies that are spending a lot of money to make these machines, and they work very hard for that money. And they should be, shouldn't be rewarded excessively, but we should use our technology so that they can get a reasonable return on their investment. I'm not saying this because some former heads of Homeland Security worked for some of these companies. It's one of those, you know, Department of Defense, uh, military-industrial complex kind of realities that are extended to the military security complex. Again, I'm going to have to excise this from the conversation. So getting back to something that will end up on the air, I'd like to thank uh, Patrick for being here today. We've had a wonderful conversation. Some of it was very much related to the book. Some of it was going a bit far afield. But I highly recommend that if you're interested, pick up a copy of Cockpit Confidential. It'll be well worth your read. Any uh, last thoughts, Patrick? Again, I I just would like to ask people the next time they fly to try to go into the experience with a slightly different perspective and and try to reappreciate flying a little bit. Um, You know, it really is a a triumph, a a triumph of technology and, and human imagination. 
uh, kind of come to life. You know, this idea that you can hop on a plane now and fly halfway around the world in almost perfect safety, that's, that's really cool. And the hassles of, of flying are duly noted. I don't like standing in long lines. I don't like cramped economy cabins any more than the next person. But there's, there's more to it than that. Uh, one last thing about uh, technology, getting back to the fact that you have a website and a book. You're an old school internet kind of guy in that you're older than 18. So are you comfortable with using Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook and all the other social media hoo-ha that seems to be all the rage with getting your message across? Uh, not, not really. Not all of those things. Uh, mostly because there are just so damn many of them. Um, it just goes on and on and on. And, and I think eventually there's going to be some sort of uh, conceptual consolidation as to how your message gets out there and which, which channels it goes over uh, visually and, and, and uh, otherwise. Um, but for the time being, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. There, there's just too much to do every time you want to, you know, post a story. Um, like you said, I'm pretty old school, so maybe this is going to sound lame to a lot of people. <laughs> you know, get with the program. Uh, there's an Ask the Pilot uh, fan page on, on Facebook that, that I don't even administer. Somebody started it on my behalf because I just don't feel like going to Facebook and doing it. Um, otherwise, though, I've got I've got uh, I've got a Twitter account. I, I do send out tweets to my fans, and, and you can sign up for the account by going to askthepilot.com and, and joining. And uh, there's the website and the book, of course, which is is available uh, electronically as well as in hard copy. So hey, I'm pretty wired. So when you post something new to the askthepilot.com website, does it automatically send out a tweet saying, "Here's a new article"? No, it doesn't, and that's because I didn't want to overwhelm people with, with uh, constant emails and tweets and so forth. Um, you know, there's an RSS feed you can sign up for. Uh, I, I keep my Twitter messages to a minimum, and I keep my uh, updates on posts, my, my emails uh, to a minimum. No more than one or two a week uh, for anybody who signs up. Well, I'd like to end on that note, and thank you very much for uh, being with us here today. To find out more about Patrick Smith, please visit patrick.airsafe.com. You can also visit Patrick's website, askthepilot.com. Thanks again for listening.